Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Immaculate Podcast, where we discuss all things fashion. Today, we're joined by Christina Binkley, who is a fashion journalist, an author, and a podcaster. She is currently editor-at-large for Vogue Business and was the Wall Street Journal's fashion and style columnist for over 20 years. She is one of my personal favorite fashion journalists, and I'm super happy to have her here. So with that said, welcome, Christina. Thank you so much for being here. I'm glad to be here. So, uh, yeah, we'll just uh, get started with the podcast um, since we have a lot to go over. So usually with the start of these, I like to get to know the person and where they grew up. So if you could just give us a quick background on like where you grew up and what are some of your early memories of being into fashion? <laughs> uh, that might not be the answer you expect. I, I grew up uh, largely in northern Delaware, although as um, a much younger kid, I lived in the Midwest in Kansas and Missouri. And um, I had just a normal person's interest in fashion for uh, the first 40 years of my life or so. You know, I dressed to go to work. Um, I did not start out as a fashion journalist. That is an accident that happened along the way. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> So back to it. So I, um, as I said, I had relatively normal interest in in fashion for the first forty years of my life or so. I was, I, um, I spent some time working as a financial analyst. Hated it. Went to graduate school. Um, and you know, my first full time job in in journalism was uh, at the Wilkesbury Times Leader in Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania. It was you know just a a local newspaper. I had a ball reporting. And I uh, went to the Tallahassee Democrat, was recruited to the Wall Street Journal from, from Tallahassee, Florida, and spent the next 23 years of my career in various um, jobs at the Wall Street Journal. And uh, I had been, I spent 10 years covering casinos in the gambling business, wrote a book about oh, wow. that, came back from, um, from my book leave. And uh, I don't remember exactly how it happened, but the, well, yeah, I do. The managing editor of the paper was supposed to drive a Ferrari that was being brought from Italy to the West Coast um, of the U.S. And, uh, and write about it. And he wasn't available to do it. And somebody at the write about it. And I said to the editor, I drive a Subaru with two child seats in the back seat. I'm, I'm not the right person to do mm -hmm. this assignment. And he said, that's your lead, go do it. And I wrote um, what turned out to be a very entertaining story about driving a Ferrari in Los Angeles. And it didn't mention any of the normal things that an automotive column would, because I don't know anything about transmissions and engines and whatever. Um, but I wrote about what it was like experiencing driving this and how other cars responded to me and you know, I wrote about what the 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 car salesman actually drove, which turns out Ferrari car salesmen can't afford to drive Ferraris. Right, so they drive other cars, and uh, and that caused somebody to think that I should be a fashion columnist, and that's literally mm -hmm. how I became a, fa a journalist who's spent quite a few years writing about the fashion industry now. Okay, so when you were studying journalism in school, you had zero inclination on writing about fashion in the future, or did you have like some interest at all? Zero. Didn't occur to me. Literally, okay. I was sitting at my desk at the Wall Street Journal when an editor called me and said, we're looking for a fashion columnist, um, and we think you should do it. And it was a conversation that went much like the Ferrari conversation yeah. went, where I was like, I don't know anything about fashion. You don't want me. <laughs> I mean, my, my first New York Fashion Week... I distinctly remember looking, getting a, a the, in those days you'd get like a printout of what all the shows were and where they were. And I looked yeah. through the brands and I recognized like Ralph Lauren and Diane von Furstenberg, right? I, most yeah. of them I'd never heard of. And, uh, you know, it was a, it was a stark learning curve. Yeah. That's such like an interesting story. Um, so they essentially just saw you, uh, they knew your work and they just handpicked you for this role. And then you ended up doing it for over 20 years. Um, so was there a huge like learning curve and being able to like, I guess, just like penetrate the industry, which something that was like very foreign to you at the time? Yeah. I mean, there's certain things about it that, that were foreign. Um, but you know, in general, a, you know, I'm alive, I wear clothes, um, and I've been interviewing executives and, um, you know, you know, very, very busy 
people who have a lot of responsibility for most of my career. So it's not mm -hmm. like it was, um, you know, it's not like I was for a long time. So I think one of the things that struck me and, and was a challenge in covering fashion is that there are so many brands and so many companies. So you can't really get to know them intensely the way you can if you're covering an industry like casinos where I knew all the casino CEOs or hotels or, you know, I've never covered automotive industry, but there aren't that many automotive makers, right? right. Whereas in fashion, there are literally hundreds, thousands of brands of various sizes. Um, you know, I learned things, you know, interviewing fashion designers is very different than interviewing fashion CEOs. Um, designers are very, they're very visual. They're not very, not, not always. Some of them are very articulate, but many of them are not particularly articulate. They're not verbal people. They're visual yeah. people. They like Instagram, not Twitter. Mm -hmm. Right. And so you have to, in, you have to approach those interviews differently if you're trying to put it out of them about what they you know, what their inspirations are, what their aims are. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, so you mentioned going to like your first fashion week. Do you remember your first fashion show and uh, just like how it was like navigating that schedule at the time? I don't think I remember the very first show. I definitely remember the very first week. Um, it was massively difficult. I didn't, nobody knew me for instance. And so mm -hmm. I had to sort of explain why I was there and needed to be at the fashion show. I had to have back in those days, all the invitations were printed. And so you had, you know, you'd run around with this sort of sheaf of invitations yeah. and you'd have to hold the right one out. And then, you know, I didn't even know the system of seating. So I didn't, you know, it's, it's kind of funny fashion math. And we talk, talk about girl math and things like that. Now there's fashion math. If yeah. you get, you know, you get an invitation and it says E123, you know, your section E front row, 23 seats down and you can count your way down to it. Right. So, um, but I didn't understand any of this stuff. So I was sort of wandering around like an idiot um, trying to figure out how to get where I needed to be. And it took, you know, it took a while to get that. And then, you you know, then I went on to Milan and Paris and, you know, the, the, some of the structures are the same, but the, but some of them are not, and they're different traditions. And of course, then you're navigating these new cities. So I would say for the first few seasons, I was in a deep confusion <laughs> a great <laughs> deal of the time. <laughs> yeah. Um, Okay, so how would you say, I know you just recently attended New York Fashion Week. How would you say um, it like really differentiated back then from now? Uh, you know, there's some things are, are sort of, they're are, are kind of technical. You know, there's New York Fashion Week doesn't really have paper invitations anymore. There are very few, Tom Brown, Don Brown likes to have them, mm -hmm. but everything is also electronic. So you're, you're just using your phone to get in places. Um, you know, now people know me, I don't really usually have to go through a gauntlet to get in places. They just wave me in. And that's a, yeah. a you know, as a journalist, that sounds like a silly thing, but it actually, <laughs> it can actually mean you get into a show on time and get your seat as opposed right. to, you know, fighting with people on the street. So there, you know, that's a personal convenience to me. Um, I think that when one of the really huge ones at Bryant Park, most of the shows, mm -hmm. and so all of New York Fashion Week was sort of centered in this one place. They usually had three venues, a really big one and two smaller ones. And much of your day you spent walking from one to another and you could sit and have a coffee in between and sort of gather your thoughts. Um, they even had places for journalists to work and file and plug in their laptops and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And um, that has completely disappeared. There's no centralized uh, point for Fashion Week anymore. And so what's happened is most of your week is spent racing pell-mell from one show to another. They have gotten, uh, you know, they're really far flung these days. It was maybe four or five years ago that Brooklyn started to become a, a venue. I mean, I almost fell on the floor the first time I was invited to a show that took place back and forth between Brooklyn and Manhattan as many mm. as three times a day. Um, and, and that's all individually for brands. This is, there are good reasons for this. They're looking for places to show, you know, they get, they get this one moment. They got, 20 minutes in the limelight to show who they are, what they're doing. And it's not just about the clothes. It's about the brand that the people that they can assemble in a room and what that room looks like and feels like there's an, an emotion involved that they're trying to convey. 
And so to go to a place that feels right to them, that looks right to them, that has the space that they need. Those are all really important individual decisions for a brand. Um, and that's why a lot of brands rejected the idea of a centralized place at, at, at Bryant Park and later at Lincoln Center. Right. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, as a whole, collectively, and I think this is why you reached out to me to talk about this, as a whole, difficult to impossible to really glean from New York Fashion Week the, the the sort of the numbers of brands and the amount of information you want either as a journalist or as a buyer or one of the many other people that are there to to absorb and discover what's happening and that's you know that's the the crux of a, the issue right now one of the one of the sort of commonly discussed things as people are sitting waiting for fashion shows to begin now Right. And, uh, you know, people coming from all over the world to attend New York Fashion Week, you know, they see Brooklyn and Manhattan on a map. It's only a few miles away or even just a couple miles. But, you know, if you're sitting in traffic, it could take 45 minutes to an hour just to go a couple miles. Um, so it kind of brings me to the next thing that I wanted to talk about was this really interesting article that you wrote um, for Vogue that was titled New York Fashion Week Needs a Mom where you discuss about the logistics and communication needed between the brands um, because these venues are, you know, they're hard to get to, you know, especially if they're showing like deep in Brooklyn and Williamsburg and then say they have one, you know, all the way up in, you know, Midtown Manhattan, or even like if somebody wanted to show in like Harlem or something um, at a special location, um, you know, what are some ways you think New York can improve the New York fashion week logistics moving forward to make it easier for everybody? Um, you know, I, I gave a great deal of thought to that and kind of looking at how other cities do their fashion weeks because, you know, Paris and Milan are also often, um, you know, they don't have centralized locations for most mm -hmm. of the brands. People are traveling all over cities. I mean, there are times in Paris when we even go sort of outside the setting of Paris and, um, They've solved it. Both both Paris and Milan have a system of providing um, transportation to people who are registered to take part in the week. And um, one of the things that I think is really essential and sort of forces everybody to work together, particularly in Paris, this works very well, is they have buses. They have a series of buses. Right. Some are for buyers and some are for journalists. So they don't have buyers and journalists sitting together, but they have buses for each of them. And you are the the uh, each show is not permitted to begin their runway until all of the buses have arrived and those people have had a chance to take their seats. And you know, I there have been snafus when somebody chose a venue that the buses couldn't get. The show runs late that day, and um, and the the authorities that running Fashion Week, which are a unit of government in France, get very upset and get involved and fix things. And I think that that is, even though really a, a small minority of the people that are attending fashion shows are on those buses, the fact that those buses control the schedule and how that plays out each day forces everybody to look at the other venues that are on the calendar that day and figure out something that's going to work. And it's, it's oddly effective. And I don't think, you know, it, as I've talked with many people, about what the solutions would be. There are, there are many other potential solutions, but that's the most sort of democratic way without an authoritarian coming in and saying, thou shalt show in this perimeter of the city. Um, I think that might be, you know, my idea of saying New York Fashion Week needs a mom was really that, you know, what do moms do in families? They make tough decisions and families get really mad at them because they don't always <laughs> like those tough decisions. And moms get really used to saying, tough, yeah. <laughs> this is how it's going, <laughs> right? And there's a certain, we New York Fashion Weeks needs somebody who's gonna be willing to take it on the chin with complaints and and make decisions that are for the greater good, even though they might not please some of the individuals that are involved. And believe me, that's tough in fashion. I mean, fashion is an mm -hmm. industry that does not like to piss people off. There are other industries where people go head to head all the time. That is not fashion. Yeah, I think what you're talking about is obviously going to be like, a, would be like a very difficult job, right? Because there's, you know, 40, 50, 60 designer shows during these New York fashion weeks and having to, you know, coordinate and 
communicate with all of these brands. Um, you know, you're not going to be able to make everybody happy. So it's going to be a very difficult job. But I think you're right. I think it is necessary because, you know, you have people that are missing shows, which, um, you know, which is Im very important for not only journalists, but like you said, buyers as well. Um, yeah, that's one of the real shames is when you come to the point and that has been increasingly a problem where you literally cannot go to the show before or after or sometimes both because getting right. to the venue um, the brooklyn navy yards is a perfect example you can't get back from there in time uh to to, to see a show the uh the other. for those for those who've never done a fashion week shows are scheduled hour by hour so there's one mm -hmm. at 10 11 12 1 2 3 all the way throughout the day you know the last one is usually at 8 sometimes 9 p.m yeah so you miss you're missing shows if you can't you really have to be able to transport from one to the next within 15 minutes, 20 max uh, to, to make it work. And sooner than that would be better. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it got to the point. So last year I went to Paris fashion week and London fashion week, and it was just faster just to take the Metro um, instead of getting an Uber or a taxi, because um, just like with the traffic of everything, you know, you just jump on the Metro. Not only is it cheaper, but, um, it's just became faster and you're just like, I got to get to the next show. It's, you know, a mile away. If I take an Uber, then it's like 30 minutes. Yeah. Um, but if I take the Metro, it's, you know, 15 to 20. Yeah. Um, so especially Paris. Me... Paris's Metro is so good. It goes everywhere. Yeah. It's really, it's very hard to, to, uh, to get there faster than the Metro and it's clean. It's on time. I mean, I can't say enough good about the Paris Metro. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's I've, I've definitely. Yeah, I've said this before. I feel like the Paris Metro is like my favorite one, at least compared yeah. to like the London Tube and like the subway in New York. Like the Paris one is so easy. It's clean. It's efficient. Yeah. I mean, to be honest with you, it's also true in New York that the subway is faster yeah. from most places than a car. But the, the issue, and this is also something that's sort of been, it was tricky before in New York, particularly post-pandemic, the subways get crazy. They're constantly changing lines, especially on weekends. They, you know, you think you're going some way, they've taken you, you know, off the local onto the express route or, or vice right. versa. And if you, if it's not your route that you commute on every single day, so you know it intimately, it can lead. I mean, I've been using subways in New York for 35 years and mm -hmm. I find I have I have wound up in Brooklyn without meaning to in the last few <laughs> years. It's just, it's just, you know, there are, there are, yeah. So New York subways don't help New York fashion week. I will say right. that at all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It could definitely be confusing. I mean, I just think from like, at least from a foreigner's perspective, you know, that's just like, if it's never taken the subway before and it's just, um, you know, it could be definitely confusing. Um, <clears throat> so there was a lot of, online discussion about New York Fashion Week kind of losing its allure. You know, a lot of the really successful American designers and brands now show in Paris. You know, everyone from, you know, like The Row to Tom Brown usually shows in Paris. Um, what are some things that New York Fashion Week could do to attract, like reattract these American designers to stay in, fa in Fashion Week um, here in America, in New York? And you know, recently when you were attending New York Fashion Week, did you feel like it lost a little bit of like that allure, that, um, you know, that special feeling that that Fashion Week always had on New York City? I think that this is been, it's a really good question. It's an incredibly important topic, particularly to smaller American brands that can't mm -hmm. afford to show in Paris. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, and I think it goes it's beyond the shows. It also has to do with the showrooms and where they can sell what has been happening in the last five years, it started before the pandemic and then it just became an avalanche in the pen pandemic or the reverse of an avalanche is that buyers started doing their purchases, a lot of them when they can, of American brands when they're in Paris, to a certain extent, Milan, but a lot of American brands now have a showroom in Paris that where they sell their collections. Mm -hmm. And that saves the buyers and also, you know, this this then translates over into journalism too, into the into the magazines that are covering it. They can do that business when they're in Paris. They don't have to come to New York Fashion Week. And that saves them money. It's expensive to come to a fashion week for yeah. a week, you know, and you mm -hmm. don't send usually one person. You're sending a team. There's airfare, there's hotels, there's food. I mean, these are very expensive investments 
for retailers as they're doing this. So if they don't have to come to New York Fashion Week, they do their buys in the brands that can't afford to have a showroom in Paris. And that's an increasing problem for American designers. And you know, if I take a step back from that, I'll say American designers get hit on both ends. They get hit on the production end because they're they're sometimes manufacturing overseas. They're almost almost assuredly getting their materials or textiles and and other notions made overseas and shipped in mm -hmm. and so you know on the on the production side they're they're getting hit with something that's they have to wait or travel and take a lot more time to produce what they're producing because it's not next door to them um, and then at the other end they're also having to go overseas to sell the stuff if they want to sell stuff outside of the american market so that's a that th those are those are very tough conundrums for designers. But uh, you know, the, they do have America, which is a pretty big market. Right. Like I remember um recently Matthew Williams was talking about um the benefits of being at Givenchy and being in Europe was you know, he could get materials, designs and something manufactured like almost in the same week, you know, just in a few days like being near Italy. You know, you could design something in Paris, send it to Italy. They could create a concept and be it shipped and have it shipped to their office, you know, just in a few days. And right. he said that was just like a huge benefit of being over there. Um, so do you think there's any way New York could provide like incentives to keep these American designers here? Um, or is it just not worth it to, you know, whether it's like give them these venues for free to like cut down on costs, um, just some, some type of incentive program to, to keep them here because... You know, Tom Brown was the highlight of New York Fashion Week. I could imagine if we had like Tom Brown like every year, you know, Tom Ford came back to New York Fashion Week. Um, you know, it just kind of create that like New York Fashion Week, you know, feeling that we once had. Um, do you think there's any like way or incentive the, the city could um, incentivize these designers to be there? Well, it's a, that's that's a money question. Right. It's where does yeah. the money come for doing it? Uh, you know, and I hear from designers all the time. Designers tell me that they get more support from the fashion system if they show in Paris. I'm not sure that's really true. Like, they don't get free venues in Paris. Mm -hmm. So um, I haven't ever been able to get a designer to sort of nail it down in terms of is their budget less? Actually, their budget is more because they have to fly the collections there. You have to have fittings. You're, you know, you're staying in hotels while you're doing castings if you're doing shows. So there's, you know, there are a lot of expenses if, you know, for a New York based designer, if they're going overseas, there's definitely an impression among designers that the system will work better for them if they can get to Paris. Uh, it hasn't always, I, you know, at one point, Zach Posen, he, when he when he had his his eponymous brand in New York and he was mm. designing party dresses and he was he was a super hot designer he got excited and he, he moved his show to Paris several seasons it was a disaster he would be the first person to tell you it was a disaster um, the collections were not well received they actually weren't particularly good he may have been distracted and he sort of came home with his tail between his legs so there are there are as many experiences out there of designers attempting it and it not going well for them. It's a, you know, Paris is a very, that's a unique fashion week. And you're, you're not just up against great designers. You're up against LVMH and caring mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and Richemont and, and uh, you know, the, the, <laughs> these are marketing machines. A lot of American designers are going to be a very tiny voice in a, a very loud week. So uh, I don't think we can assume that that's an answer for everybody. But then on the other side in, you know, in New York, you know, I've talked to Tom Brown about this. And, and last week I sat down with him and talked with him about this and said, you know, what about things giving more support to designers in the United States? And he, he's a very tough love kind of guy about this. He's, he's yeah. like, I paid for all my shows. I built my brand myself. You got to work hard kids. <laughs> you know, that's his attitude is get out there and, and make it work work harder than everybody else so yeah i i saw in the article that um you mentioned that willie chavaria um paid three hundred and fifty thousand dollars for a show and i guess tom brown just kind of shrugged his shoulders like hey like i had to do the same thing uh when i was starting as well right yeah i know and that is you know 
I'll tell you, for Willie Chavaria, that $350,000 was probably money well spent. He was one of the highlights of the week. He's yeah. got a strong voice in fashion. He's definitely coming places. You know, he's not a kid. He's been working in fashion for years, so he really knows what he's doing, and I think he's spending his money very well. That is so rare. That is so rare. Mm -hmm. Most designers are focused on making apparel, particularly New York fashion designers, maybe accessories. Apparel is the least profitable part of fashion, right? Like the money, <laughs> the money's in accessories, shoes, belts, you know, fragrance, all these things that are much harder to do. Uh, and you usually don't do them first. So, uh, you know, and they're not show people. They don't really, I mean, they, we, we build this idea of, around the necessity of having a show. But the way we do shows now in fashion, unlike when they were back at Bryant Park, same runway. And what that did is it really focused your on your, on the models and the clothes. Now the box is different for everybody. And these designers are like, you know, scouting the city for venues that haven't been shown in before and sort of creating moods. And all of that, of course, is very costly and takes away from their attention on the rest of their business. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, it seems like Willie's creating just like a really good culture around his brand. You know, he released that short film with his show yeah. um, and he released a playlist. I was actually listening to it on Spotify. It was like, you know, you're just like bobbing your head as you're like listening to this song that was, you know, that play during this, this little movie that he made. Yeah. Um, so I think he's doing an excellent job with that. Just like creating this culture around his brand, you know, it creates like a fan base. We're just yeah. like following everything they do. Um, you know, another one that's really, I think is doing such a wonderful job is Loire. And, oh, you know, yeah. and, and, and there you've got, that's a perfect example of how the system can really work for a brand. So every single season, Loire shows at 9 PM out way out in Brooklyn. It's mm -hmm. always just a, 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 a pardon my French, but it's just a shit show outside because there's so many fans <laughs> yeah. that are trying to get into the after party that aren't going to be allowed in that it's very hard to even make your way in. And it's worth going through it all to go in because you get in that room where his show is, there is so much excitement and love and passion among the people that are at the show. He is creating something that really that they, people identify with. He's th There's such a strong community there that it's uplifting. I'm not part of that community. I'm not going to wear Loire, mm -hmm. but it doesn't matter. I can feel it when I'm in the room that this is really important to people. And I mean, you just, you got to go to that show last in the day so you don't have to try to get out of there and get to the next yeah. one. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, this system works for designers who've, built a community who are really smart about that, who are making it work for them. But there's just a lot of, you know, a lot of New York is really more about making apparel than making shows. Yeah. Yeah. And Raul Lopez, like you said, is a perfect example for Loire, you know, and he's been in fashion for a long time, you know, with right. hood, hood by Air. And then obviously with this Loire, um, he's creating this huge culture. And then obviously Beyonce coming to a show is just like <laughs> yeah. kind of like catapulted to, to a new level. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really it's fun to see that happening. Yeah, definitely. You know, I I mean you said something too. You know, you noticed that these two people that we're just talking about, Willie and Raul, they they aren't new designers just coming out of school. Right. Like they've yeah. they worked a ton of places, had a lot before before they reached the point where they're sort of really making waves and making a difference. Mm -hmm. uh, I I would I would hope that <clears throat> you know, I was talking to to um the head of the, the dean of um, uh, SCAD, the fashion school at SCAD in South Carolina. And I said, you know, how often do your, uh, do your students ask about running a business? And he said, never. They never ask about that. They're all focused yeah. on creating amazing clothes, which is, you know, they're focused on creating art. But so many come out of school and want to immediately launch a brand maybe after a couple of internships. And I think that's a fantasy that doesn't really happen to many people. It's like Marilyn Monroe being discovered on the, on Hollywood Boulevard or something like that's, that's yeah. the fantasy. That's not really what happens. Yeah. I mean, you have to create a culture these days. Like you look at what like Glenn Martins is doing with diesel. Um, he's creating these like fashion shows that are like accessible to everybody, 
you know, he's like selling yeah. tickets to his shows. So it's like thousands of people coming. Um, you know, he had this 24 hour live stream of the atelier of them, like making these clothes and uh, styling them on the models these last few days. And, um, yeah, it's like you have to create that culture and create this like fan base, almost like a sports team or something that you're just like following very closely. Well, and Glenn Martin, I mean, they're actually doing it, you know, in sports venues sometimes. Right. Those are really, they're, you know, again, though, now you have a wealthy backer, you know. Yeah. He's He's got Renzo, you know, backing that whole thing. That's mm -hmm. very different. You know, he's he's a designer who's employed for a brand that's existed for a long time and is very well established, which, and he's done a remarkable job of bringing in, I mean, you know, a lot of what he's showing on the runway is literally haute couture. It's the model that big brands can do where the stuff on their runway doesn't really sell or doesn't really sell much, but um, but it, it fuels a passion and they sell a lot of just regular jeans and jeans jackets and things like that. Right. Um, yeah, so we talked about some like um, emerging designers and um, talked about, you know, the struggles of New York Fashion Week. You know, we just saw that Puppets and Puppets um, yeah. announced that they were doing their last runway show this last New York Fashion Week. And um, Carly Mack, the founder and creative director, is moving to London just to do accessories now. Um, just, you know, flatly said that it's too expensive to make clothes and have these runway shows. Um, what are some ways that, like, emerging designers... Um, could kind of get like their, I guess their finances in a row where they're able to sustain this longevity of like making clothes and having these runway shows. Cause like you mentioned, you know, a lot of these designers in school, they just want to create this art and they're not thinking about from a business perspective. Um, from your perspective, what, what are some ways that you think that um, these emerging designers could cr can create like this brand, like sustainability for a long time? Well, I mean, there are, there are, uh so many more opportunities now because you can sell direct to consumers and not have to go through the wholesale mm. model. Yeah. I mean, that, and that's not easy, by the way, selling direct to consumers. And I don't think the Instagram model of sales is working for anybody. Um, it's, it's so cluttered with, you know, disparate brands that are actually operating out of China and drop, sh drop shipping in. And so I, I don't, I wouldn't advise anybody to depend, you know, start a brand and depend on Instagram, um, for their sales anymore that we thought that was going to work a few years ago. But I think, you know, the, I, I first, if you're not wildly well financed, then you got to start small and you got to grow. I hate this term, but organically, right? Like mm -hmm. not big leaps of things. And it is possible. A lot of you, you need somebody, it may not be the designer, it may be their partner, but you need somebody who really understands business and finance and uh, you know how you know how much you manufacture, not over my manufacturing. But one of the business models that intrigues me most these days is one that almost no designer is thinking about, just a very small, which is a storefront with a studio in back and selling in front. Is that going to mm. scale? No. I mean, you know, if you want to scale and be the next Ralph Lauren, then then you need heavy duty financing and investors and backers right yeah and if if and and really smart business people but you know it is possible to be a designer on a small scale and not and not sort of take the 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 tech world the silicon valley approach to everything that it you know that it should grow as fast as an app if you want to be in fashion and be a huge brand, then you have to make the kind of products that build huge brands. And that's selling fragrances and accessories and cosmetics and things like that. Yeah. There are a few companies that really make it selling apparel, but very few. It's, it's no joke that Tom Ford started his own eponymous brand with sunglasses, right? He didn't, right. He didn't start making custom suits. He started with sunglasses. He built the accessories business. He got... He got the profits in place and then continued to expand. And right. um, and that's generally not the dream of <laughs> every designer. There's most designers are dreaming of creating looks for the Oscars or the Grammys or you know. Yeah, I think um like one designer that kind of comes to mind is Kid Super. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, he was a guy that had his storefront and he was making the clothes in like the back room um at his store in Brooklyn for a long time. 
and now he just moved into a, a new warehouse. Um, I don't know how the new setup is, but um, yeah, that was a guy that was kind of like building it up slowly, right? Um, somebody that was like creating these clothes in the background and then um, having the storefront at the front of the store. Yeah, you know, there's, you know, I would also I'd point out one that she gets ignored a lot in fashion in terms of fashion appeal. But if you look at the business of Tori Birch, oh yeah, you know that's another one. I mean, and she's now selling. Uh, uh, she's more than two billion in revenue. I mean, she's a mm -hmm. she's not she's not even medium sized anymore. She's actually yeah. big, and yeah. but she started with a store, <laughs> literally a store in New York that sold out very quickly, and she kept replenishing it. It's it's a different era, um, but you know she's she's slowly expanded her business in a lot of different areas that she's not even known for like sportswear. I mean, you can buy like serviceable, I don't I mean like athletic wear, you can buy clothes to play golf in, to play tennis in the kind of sports that a Tory Burch kind of person might play. Um, I think those are largely sold online because they don't work real well in stores. They tried that. Like that is literally her company. <laughs> Yeah. So I, I, my hat is off to her in terms of business success. And if you talk with her, it's been very slow, careful, cautious motion the whole way without, you know, without going the sort of the gap route, building a million stores and spending all your money on stores and then finding out you don't have the right product to sell. You can really, you can go bankrupt really quickly by rushing to grow. Yeah, I think I remember Mark Jacobs talking about this. You know, after he left Louis Vuitton, he said, "Oh, we bought a store, um, you know, somewhere in like Midtown Manhattan, um, and then we realized we didn't have any money to make clothes, so we had to raise some money, <laughs> uh, which you know could be a huge problem, especially if you're a, a young emerging designer with you know little finances and little investment. Um, you know, Mark Jacobs obviously he ended up doing well and he had a lot of connections already the fashion industry, but yeah, if you do that, it could." you know, it could almost ruin you pretty quickly. Yeah. That, you know, I mean, it, you know, again, I come back to, I wish there were more people encouraging fashion students to think about how they want to make and distribute their art. Yeah. I mean, we, it's okay. Art is fine. But if you haven't thought about how you're going to get it out there, then you're going to get stuck quickly and we just see a lot of brands disappearing including brands that you know got a rush of support from the cfda and vogue fund and things like that and they're not here anymore we don't see them or yeah. not much of them right so there's a magic that happens if you're going to build a brand and a fashion week is only a small part of that and i'm not even sure i'm not convinced that runway shows are for everyone i'm not sure that right. that really plays out um if you can't afford it, you know, any designer that's selling their car or mortgaging their house for a fashion show, please don't like that's, there's other ways to sell your collections. And there's, if you go, you know, even if you're in a wholesale model, if you walk through any department store, most of the brands that are fashion shows, a lot of them do, but a lot of them don't. And it, there's no shame, by the way, in, in making actual apparel that real people want to wear to work. Everything doesn't have to be a runway look or a street style look, right? There's an, um, actually American designers have traditionally been really, really good at making clothes that real people want to wear. Mm -hmm. I would throw Carhartt out there, by the way, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, they just did a collaboration with uh, Sakai, I think the other yeah. day. Um, <laughs> Yum, right? I mean, yeah. that's such a great idea. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, I mean, it's great. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I know you mentioned like Tori Birch. Uh, you saw her and her brand kind of grow from like just a storefront to like, you know, $2 billion in revenue. Um, during New York Fashion Week, were there any other like emerging designers that like really impressed you? Um, were there any shows that you're like, oh, this could be a brand that could like really be here for a long time? Well, I think R Willie Chavaria would be the first one that comes to my mind with that, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's, I'm looking at that, you know, that's strong appeal. It's a strong look, but he's knows how to build a community. He knows how to do business. I mean, there's, he's got a lot of the parts working for him yeah. that make me think, you know, that could go places. Um, God, you know, it makes me want to look back at let me take a moment and look back. Yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to, one of the things that happens during fashion weeks is it all sort of runs together. 
Oh, and then trust I me, feel I like I'm, know. you know, yeah. <laughs> so, um, who did I, let's see, who is I? Um, oh, you know, um, I don't know about big business, but Kalina Strada is another, she mm -hmm. is another brand that is, um, A, she's built a really passionate community and her collection this year, this time, um, was actually a little, it was more wearable. It looked a little bit more sophisticated in terms of something you could produce and sell, mm -hmm. which suggests that there's some growth there. So I, she's definitely one to watch. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to miss, you know, Kate has had, um, she's got money. Um, it's, you know, private, she's got investors that have helped make that happen, but it's been used very well. She's good businesswoman um, and may, and may have good business brines, but that's, that's, you know, she's well established and, and sort of, growing every season uh, um uh let's see what else those were those were really standouts that i have to say it was a, it was a shame to see puppets and puppets oh form again everybody's talking oh, about I form i don't know anything about the business end of it but when you have that much conversation about you Mm -hmm. going on then i think you got to consider that's real i'd also say that they don't show um um, the row, they, the Olsons don't show at, in, in New York anymore. They show in Paris, but they are yeah. a very American brand nonetheless, and, um, have survived <laughs> countless rumors of their demise <laughs> yeah. over, over the years. And I've, you know, I, you know, there are some interesting things about that business that I've observed covering it over the years. I'll be the first one to say I did not take it seriously. I didn't even go to their shows the first few seasons because I was like, what would the Olsen twins know about fashion? I mean, this yeah. is, you know, what, 15 years ago now or something, but they clearly know a lot about fashion. Their clothes are beautifully made with great materials. Mm -hmm. um, and they do one of, you know, they very secretly do something that some brands are now starting to strut about, uh, which is that they they design clothes that fit all kinds of sizes of bodies. They don't ever yeah. talk about it, but if you go into a row store, you will find large sizes and designs that work for large sizes. So there's mm -hmm. some thought there, um, you know, stolen right from the pages of Chanel, which does the same thing, by the way. Um, so that I think there's some brands that have managed to operate for women. And this is more important in women's wear, they they operate without ever discussing that they've got whatever you want to call that large larger size market but they they just do it and they get found and it's again a not a, not an american brand but a very expensive luxury brand that has um managed manages to dress many of the world's female ceos and politicians and sort of people of that ilk yeah, I love the row. I think their designs are fantastic. That's so interesting to see that, um, you know, initially they weren't taking that seriously because, you know, of their celebrity. And then now they've gone to like being like really revered by everyone in the fashion industry. Um, I did want to switch uh, topics a little bit here um, and talk about fast fashion. Hmm. Um, you know, fast fashion isn't a new concept. You know, it's been around for a long time. Like I remember seeing Forever 21 in every mall in America. Um, how do you think the impact of fast fashion has become on emerging designers? Is it more difficult now because people would rather buy 10 pieces from, you know, Sheen and then post about it online as opposed to supporting a, a New York emerging designer and buying one or two pieces for them for a higher price? Do you think that has a negative impact on these emerging designers? Yes, uh, it definitely has a negative impact on them, and in, in, in myriad ways. Uh, we should we should point out, by the way, that when when you know the Forever Twenty One that you're remembering and mm -hmm. Zara being everywhere, if you went in now to look at Zara, Zara doesn't even feel like fashion fashion anymore. It feels so much more high quality. It does, yeah. And then um, then you know, so what Zara was doing was, sort of, I mean, they were definitely knocking off looks and things and just putting them out there faster and, and more cheaply. We've now come to a level with Team U and Shein that to a level of, uh, you know, almost trash clothing, quite frankly, you, they're really not made to withstand many wearings at all. Yeah. Um, but they're so cheap that the, 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 the in my mind, the most dangerous thing about, well, there's two really dangerous things. First of all, they have taught 
it, we're now going on two generations, but specifically um, for Sheehan and, and Timu, one generation of training people to expect to, to, to not understand what real pricing is. If you think a pair of pants should cost $12, you are simply not going to understand what went into making a pair of pants that's priced at $200 or $250 that were made, you know, well made that you'll have your, your, your round for your life. And so there is such wide expectations of cheap prices among most consumers that it, they can't even, they, they almost think it's wrong to pair to pay a fair living wage and sometimes it's the same people that are like I, you know i'm only going to get fair trade coffee and i'm definitely going to pay 20 dollars for a pound of coffee because i want to make fair trade and then they don't want to spend 180 dollars for a pair of pants because somehow that feels decadent as opposed to oh the people who made that not just the pants themselves but the fabric were actually paid a living wage we're just too divorced from it and so we don't understand that. So that's one big problem. The other big problem that we're seeing now with fast fashion is that the, the, these companies that are made overseas, you know, China and Asia, a lot of it, um, have figured out that they orders into the United States to consumers and not pay tariffs because tariffs are made on exports in big quantities and these drop ship one item things are excluded from that. And until US Congress figures out a way to cut out that loophole, what happens is that fast fashions are even cheaper and they're literally putting, at the time magazine had a story out this, this week that um, was looking at the you know, businesses literally being driven out of business. I think there were just in the last few months, there were 10 apparel factories that closed in the United States as a result of this competition. So it's very real and it's happening very quickly. We don't have 20 years to solve this. Yeah, I, I did read that article. Um, and essentially, I, I think, uh, Fly, I remember right, it's if the package or whatever they're sending is below a value of $800, then they don't have to pay like the duty and they get a lot of tax benefits. Um, so, you know, if they're just shipping in low power quantities, then, um, you know, it's making it a lot cheaper for the consumer. Um, and then obviously that has like a ripple effect on like, the designers and the manufacturers here in America, like you mentioned, um, what do you think the government or Congress could do to be able to combat this? Um, is there a way just like to push a policy that they have to pay these duty and taxes uh, for any type of shipment? Yeah. I mean, I think that's the first thing is you just, you, you, you've got to cut uh, these big, big companies out. I mean, these are massively valuable companies, right? Right. That are taking advantage of loopholes that were meant so that, you know, somebody, you could send a package to your grandma overseas right. without having to pay a thing. On. So, you know, that's, that's the first thing, uh, you know, Biden's infrastructure act is, is, um, really focused on, uh, on, you know, putting more money into American manufacturing of all things, not just apparel, but my hope is that there will be more textile and apparel mills that will be able to um, open here and service the the American designers. We've almost forgotten what we had in the United States yeah. well within my lifetime in terms of, a, of apparel manufacturing. And there, there are, you know, we're never going to be able to compete on a global scale with hand done labor because we we pay our workers too much. Mm -hmm. Not that they're not that those workers are getting rich. It's just that when you compare it to what you pay them in in Asia, you know, Pakistan, uh, we, we're never going to compete on that. But but there are you know with robotics and there's a lot of technology. There are ways that we can bring more of those skills back in the United States. It's also if you talk to designers the cost of designers flying overseas constantly to check on the work, to get samples and whatnot, flying samples back and forth because you have to fly them. You don't get them quick enough if you send them by sea. There are so many additional costs that, um, that, that, uh, that American apparel manufacturers pay in order to, to manufacture overseas that they're, they're, you know, you start to see that there are opportunities for manufacturing domestically. Yeah, I've, I've definitely heard from some other designers like, you know, sometimes they don't have the funds to go over there. So they essentially just write a big check, you know, $10,000, $20,000, give it to a manufacturer and just cross your fingers and hope that everything works out correctly. 
Um, but you know, obviously it's in their best interest to like visit them and talk with them and see how it's being manufactured. But, you know, sometimes they just don't have the funds. They're like, here's the designs, here's the check. Uh, hopefully it arrives in four to six months, like just like we wanted. And, um, you know, we're able to have like a good product after that. Yeah. And it almost never does, by the way. I mean, yeah. I've heard that a, a million times, of course. I mean, because any designer knows that when you, and, and you know, I, it cracks me up. Ad Italian designers take this so much for granted that they can have the manufacturer nearby and there's so much give and yeah. take. But that's how you get high quality, right? You go to people right. who are really good at what you're doing. The, the, sort of, the, the sort of mass model, the scale model has to be that it, that you don't have as much interaction and you cut out a lot of corners and you get a lower quality product. It, that's just, that's the nature of it. Yeah. Like, um, Jerry Lorenzo for fear of God. Um, you know, he's, he spent a lot of time in Milan and he was like documenting a lot of it. Um, you know, he said he wanted to go to the manufacturer and feel the materials and see the manufacturing because he was like, this collection is just so important to me. That there's no way I'm going to let like anything slip up with this collection. So, you know, he was spending like weeks of weeks of a time in Milan and other parts of Italy, just making sure that everything was right. And, uh, you know, he has like the finances for that fear of God has been around for a long time, but yeah, it's tough for a young designer to be able to, you know, oversee everything to make sure that their vision is actually carried out the way that they want it. Uh, You're reminding me of a conversation I had years ago with, um, a footwear designer is Italian. He had been designing shoes for Dior and for Sergio Rossi. He was the design, the designer of, of Sergio Rossi shoes. And he left Sergio Rossi to start his own brand. He was living in Milan and he, he was, he was belly aching that he had to learn to drive again because he had a driver. So, you know, he was driven around. If he had to go to the factory, they drove him to the factory and whatnot. And he had to get a, he had to buy a car and learn to drive so that he could go to all these different factories and look at who was going to manufacture this line of shoes that was coming out. And I'm hearing him and he's thinking it's a hardship to drive to the factories. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking about how many American designers would find that such a luxury to be able to drive a few hours and see the people that are making their shoes or their uppers or their lasts or, you know, whatever it is. It's sort of, it's all what you're, <laughs> what you're yeah. used to. Yeah. I mean, it would be such a blessing of like, you know, everyone could just go to downtown LA and just like see how things are being made and manufactured in like the garment district or something. Um, I mean, that would just be like such a, a blessing for any designer in like Southern California. Right. Um, yeah. It does so, exist. I mean, Rodarte yeah. manufactures de in downtown LA. There's a lot. There's there's actually there are several factories that are doing European quality work in downtown LA. That that was it wasn't true 15 years ago that luxury apparel manufacturers could make their clothes in Los Angeles. It is now. There there are factories. Uh, Rodarte manufactures their uh, you know their runway looks, their mm -hmm. their uh, red carpet looks in a factory in downtown Los Angeles, and uh, quite a number of designers are doing that. And that's very new. It's taken years, I'd say 10 years or so, for the skill set to be developed here. So the, the, yeah. you know how to do the right, you know, the seaming, how to work with those materials. But what you have to do is import the fabrics themselves because those aren't being made here. Right. Yeah. I think I have heard of some designers actually relying on that, at least initially uh, designers like John Elliott and like Mike Amiri. Um, they've done a lot of work with like the downtown LA, like manufacturing in the past. Um, okay. So uh, are you heading to any other fashion shows or fashion weeks this upcoming like fashion month that we're in? Well, uh, I, I, I don't want to say I'm um, lucky, but I, uh, after many years of uh, doing the full circuit uh, and being on the road for close to five weeks uh, for, for seasons, I have cut way back. The pandemic taught me that I could actually survive without doing all the fashion weeks. And that's allowed me to discover some other things. So uh, I did New York fashion week. I'm staying here in Los Angeles next week. I'll be covering freeze, which uh, freeze LA, which is an art show. And there are a lot of dynamics happening between the art world and fashion now that I think may be more important than runways in some ways. So I'm looking at freeze for that. And then will come the Oscars and I'm, I don't cover red carpets per se, but the Oscars is, is an economy and a very fashion oriented economy of its own. Right. So, so I'm, I'm trying to look at 
fashion more deeply than just covering runways. What's uh, like your favorite fashion show you ever been to? Or do you have like a favorite designer that you always looked forward to going to their shows? Oh my God, so many. It's not fair to ask me to choose one. <laughs> um, it's not about whether I like the clothes or like a favorite design. When you talk about a favorite designer, like, you know, that's a very different issue for me than, um, you know, you know, is the show expressing something? I mean, I have literally never not thoroughly enjoyed myself at a Tom Brown show. Yeah. You know, even even back in the early days when they weren't the big budget affairs that they were now, there have been, I've told, you know, I've told this story many times, but the one that comes to my mind was well, he took us into an insane asylum and <laughs> the, the inmates of the insane asylum were the models yeah, and yeah. they were walking from room to room to room and there were gurneys. It was it was kind of scary, but not really. And I, I couldn't contain my laughter. I mean, I think I was obnoxious because I was just laughing so hard um, as these sort of ghosts came through and whatnot. So, I mean, you know, there are designers who really know how to entertain you that way. You know, there's the other end, you go to Haute Couture in Paris and now, now you're, you know, watching the, the, attendees is as much fun as watching the runways there because mm -hmm. one of the one of the lovely things about a lot of the haute couture shows in paris is the people who are attending the shows are actually shopping right so you see a whole family and the mom is like pointing out to the daughter and you think my god that daughter is going to order that dress it costs one hundred and seventy thousand dollars <laughs> yeah you know that's like it's like it's a whole world <laughs> that most right. of us don't get to observe but it's it's super fun to to see that. So you know there are m many many aspects of seeing collections that are um, entertaining. Yeah, I guess like with as many like designers that you've interacted with and shows that you've been to, it's kind of hard to pick like a favorite one. Um, do you have a favorite fashion week you like to attend? You know, a lot of people say Paris just because the you know the big brands show there. But do you have like a favorite week? Uh, I don't know that I have a favorite week. I like each of them for different things. Okay. Yeah. You know, there's, you know, N London fashion week, there's an incredible amount of sort of camaraderie among the, mm -hmm. the London press. And I, I enjoy that. Um, Milan is definitely the fashion week to eat at. It's, you will, you know, not what you're thinking, but that's the best food of any of the fashion <laughs> weeks you're yeah. going to go to. So <laughs> enjoy that. I have all my little secret places in Milan that I love. It's the biggest brands and you have to, I, I think nobody should talk about Paris as being a better fashion week than others than without also understanding that it's also the best funded and the brands right. are the best funded and the week is the best funded. So when you have the most money, you can do the most. And yeah. it's sort of not, it, it's not fair to compare Paris to London, for instance. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, you just, you not fair. Yeah. Or a lot of people are talking about Copenhagen being like a, a really good fashion week oh. because go ahead yeah i'm so glad you brought that up i mean they have blasted onto the fashion world um with their own very unique approach to what yeah. that is and I, one of the things that's lovely about it is that for a lot of the copenhagen brands that are showing there you you can kind of look at that runway and say oh that must have been copenhagen fashion week right yeah. like the, again they're speaking with a real voice as to what they want to be as a fashion week you know, if we come back to New York Fashion Week, I think that's one of the things that's kind of been lost. There's so many designers that are trying to be Paris brands, and mm. that's not that's not American. When you look at a lot of the crucial brands that have created what New York Fashion Week is and what what American fashion brands are, it's it's Ralph Lauren, Donna Karen, Calvin Klein, you know, Diane von Furstenberg. They they were all making clothes that are you know intensely about real people's lives, women going to work, men working on the range, whatever, you know, whatever it is, um, they're very specifically American looking. And somehow we've let go of that and tried yeah. to be something else. And, you know, you know, I, I, I shouldn't, you know, not mention Oscar de la Renta, a very American designer, but mm -hmm. doing clothes on a, on par with what, what Paris fashions were. So there's, it's not that we can't do that kind of luxury as American brands. It's just that we, we, we kind of diss it a little bit. And I think that's one of the things that's wonderful about Willie Chavaria and Loire is that they are exploring something that's very American and also very much about the communities that they operate in. Yeah, definitely. Um, 
So I know you mentioned that uh, obviously you've interviewed a lot of, you know, powerful designers, politicians, whatever it may be. Who would be like your, um, I guess, dream interview to um, profile for an article? You mean a, an article about fashion? Yeah. Hmm. Or you could give me one, let's say one fashion and one non-fashion. Well, you know, I've have, I mean, I do a lot of profiling of people and um, I, I tend to like the profiles about people who are um, not really in fashion, but either want to be or actually don't want to be. So, mm -hmm. you know, I would love to, I, I, I'm not going to share a name because I don't want to put that out there, but there are female business leaders who um, walk a tightrope between how they present themselves with their clothes, clothes or language. I mean, you spend your life in that. Right. I don't have to tell you that, right? So we communicate that way. But it's very difficult for women in business to do that. And if I could find a woman business leader that would actually let me in and talk to me about that relationship she has with, with fashion, um, I would be, I would love to do that. I have found men that will do that. By the way, yeah. I interviewed, a, became somebody in the Trump administration. I think he's canceled now, but this was before that. And he talked about, you know, how, what he wore into business meetings when he was negotiating with, with, you know, adversaries and that he would sort of, no matter how much he sweated, he would keep that jacket on in a hot room that was unair conditioned because he just had to beat them out of it. And they would sort of give up and take their jacket off. And then he <laughs> knew he had it because they had no jacket on and yeah. he had it on. Like I, I love to be able to talk about clothes that way. I think you're probably really looking for, um, you know, for a, a, you know, an interview, you know, that's very fashion related. I would absolutely love to sit down with, um, both Bernard Arnault and mm. Francois Henri Pinot and have them, this is never going to happen, by the way. This is right. just my fantasy to have them both in a room doing a joint interview where I could talk to them about building their businesses, how they look at fashion um, and luxury. I mean, that, that would be my absolute dream interview, but that's one that won't. won't yeah. So place. are they, are they like butting heads a little bit? Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Arno has has Pinot beat at this point. He's got a much bigger company. Now, yeah. Pinot's going in a slightly different direction. He just took a ma you know, majority state stake in CAA. Um it's 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 not through caring, it's through the family's private arm, so it's private. But now that makes him uh, you know, an important guy in Hollywood. We'll see how that plays out yeah. for European luxury brands. How about like a non fashion person? Is there any like big time celebrity or politician or, or somebody that fascinates you that you'd like to profile? Hmm. I, you know, that my answer to that would probably change every single week. I mean, there's hundreds okay. of them. I, I live yeah. to do this. So it's not, it's not like I have, um, you know, an idea of somebody that I would really, you know, other than, you know, for years I've thought I'd love to get Pino and Arnaud in the same room, but mm -hmm. um, that's, you know, that's because of the sort of fishbowl that, that they live in. But other than that, it's, you know, usually, you know, I spent months um, with Kanye, um, yay, whatever you want to call him, mm -hmm. back before he late, you know, his recent canceling. This is, this was right before the pandemic started, as a matter of fact, in, the, in 2019. It wasn't something, it was somebody sort of part of his um, entourage came to me and um, tried to get me to write about him and his this fashion stuff. And um, I didn't want to do it and said no. And I just kind of, you know, one thing happened and another thing happened. And I, I realized that actually there was something significant that he contributed to the fashion space, which was color, quite frankly. And I ended up spending a lot of time with him. And it was, um, it was kind of in some ways a distressing experience because he's not healthy. Yeah. Um, and, uh, He's, he was turned out to be less healthy than even I knew <laughs> at the time. But really? Um, I really, well, I think, you know, subsequent <laughs> things have happened that we, we right. all know that now. But, um, but it, was, uh, it was a profile that I'm really glad I did um, for a variety of reasons, even though it's about somebody who, you know, is 
you know, continues to be canceled. And I don't think people are excited about reading it anymore. It was an, it was a journey for me as well as a profile that I really enjoyed doing. Several years ago, I wrote a profile of Sterling Ruby for the New Yorker. And this was, this was an article that, um, again, I spent close to a year on it, probably nine months. And, you know, he's not a fashion person, he's an artist, mm -hmm. but he was doing a line of art, I mean, a line of fashion that he hadn't yet come out with. And he was fascinated with fashion, partly through a friendship that he has with Raph Simmons. And um, he let me inside that process for many months and how how, it, how that sort of unfolded and how he made it work. And the, the thing that intrigued me about it was that he was both really obsessed with creating this fashion line and also absolutely terrified that the art world was going to cancel him because he was doing something as déclassé as fashion. Mm. And that sort of, you know, that so opportunities like that where you, I mean, I again, I stumbled on that. I didn't, I was taking a tour of his art studio and he gave me a glimpse of this room with a bunch of garments hanging in it. And I was like, say what? And it <laughs> led to that. But, um, you know, I love those sort of unexpected people that discover that they have a relationship with fashion, which I mean, that maybe that maybe that's because that's me. Because now I have a relationship to fashion that I never intended to have. Yeah. <laughs> um, I did want to talk to you a bit about like the journalism landscape now. Um, obviously, we've seen a lot of publications, newspapers, magazines laying off a lot of journalists and staff. Yeah. Um, how do you foresee like the future of journalism now, especially in a world now where a lot of it is video and social media related? Um, like how does somebody become a journalist this, uh, these days? Uh, it's a scary time, you know, as, as, um, I talk to journalism students pretty frequently mm -hmm. and, um, I, I think this is a particularly difficult time. I, I think it's going to be easier in 10 years than it is now because we're still in this tremendous shakeup. This is another one of these things where, where the world doesn't happen in isolation. And I think what's happening in journalism is the same thing that's happening with department stores um, in retail. So um, department stores have too much space. We don't shop that way anymore. We've yeah. got all these big mall based things and, and they're, they're full of too much stuff. And I think journalism, we don't have space to have a lot of New York Times is anymore. There's going to be a few national newspapers or new, a few national magazines that are going to do well and, and cover general news. And then what we're seeing is we're developing a lot of specialists that can afford to do it because they're not old school. They're not printed on paper or at least not printed on paper often. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and there's so many of them that are opening now. I think I just, I was reading 404 Media, which is a few months old this morning. And it's hard as somebody who's a news junkie, I, I, I'm i like, I can't even figure out who to subscribe to anymore because there's so many of them and I don't know how it's all going to shake out. So I'm kind of watching. But if you fast forward 10 years, there's going to be some people that have really become dominant and figured out what the new model is. I mean, right now we're experimenting. Is nonprofit the way to go? It is apparently for some organizations. Is specialty, like you've got the 19th fantastic news organization focused on women and news impacting women. There's, I find this really exciting, but I don't know how it's going to play out. And so to, to advise a young I think it would just be be open to have a lot of different experiences and don't compromise on the quality of your work. That's got to be because I, I, I wouldn't be able to say, oh, you should go one direction or another. By the way, one thing I would say is don't ever be afraid to start small. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's true. I see a lot of news organizations <laughs> hiring from small online publications, big, you know, big publications. Um, and it's a it's a route. When we started talking today, I mentioned that my first full-time job in journalism was at the Wilkes-Barre Times Leader, which was a small mm -hmm. local newspaper. The other, <clears throat> the other way I could have gone was to be a news assistant, news assistant at the New York Times, and a lot of my colleagues preferred to go with the big name papers because it was very prestigious, and I was afraid I would just be getting copy for people, coffee for people. Um, yeah. 
and I wanted to actually write stories. And so I went to this decidedly not glamorous job mm -hmm. at the Wilkes-Barre Times Leader, which was, by the way, one of my favorite jobs that I've ever had. I absolutely loved working at that paper. I loved the people. I loved the team. I loved the stories I was working on. Definitely would advise somebody who's starting out in journalism to not go for the prestige, but go for the place where you're going to be able to, to do the work that you want to do and do it well, even if it's tiny, even if the audience is tiny. Yeah. So do you suggest, um, you know, a lot of people start their own blogs or they're posting regularly on social media, you know, their thoughts about whether it's like runway shows or, you know, their thoughts on designers, emerging designers, for example, would you encourage people to just continue to do that? Just like build your own platform, get, just get your stuff out there that you really want to do and then build a portfolio before uh, moving on to like a bigger publication. I, I think to a certain extent, yes. And I say that cautiously because, you know, Substack has been like a big thing for a lot of journalists, even experienced journalists. And I think yeah. if you look at experienced journalists on Substack, that's exactly the warning that, that um, I want to make, which is that we all, I don't care how good you are, we all need editors. We all need yeah. collaborators. And when you fly out there with no support system, what you read on, on Substack from a lot of very experienced, really smart people is shockingly bad with terrible grammatical errors mm. and spelling errors and things like that. So um, I love that people can put their own stuff out there, but they better be good or get somebody right. to help out, right? Like, don't think you can do it alone. I don't care if you've won a Pulitzer Prize. We all make mistakes and editors yeah. make me smarter every single day. I love nothing better than a great editor. And I don't think we should, you know, we should be seeking that out somehow. So that's my, that's my, that's my yes with caveats to putting your own stuff out there. If you don't have an alternative, mm -hmm. then super, but you know, I'd rather see somebody go someplace where they're going to learn I mean, I don't, I don't think this is unlike saying a fashion student coming out of fashion school should go work at a brand and learn how, how success works before they try to do it on their own. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, I think being part of something and collaborating and working with an editor, it just makes you better in the end, right? Um, so I think you're, you're absolutely right with that. Um, if somebody wanted to work for, you know, a big publication like like Vogue um, or, you know, GQ or, you know, another big like fashion publication, um, you know, what are some ways that they could get noticed then? You know, if they're say they have a sub stack, they're putting out their own work, you know, they're trying to create this content and get noticed. Um, you know, how do they get their name out there if it's fashion isn't easy to, you know, network in if you don't know anybody. So. Like, how do they get their name out there? Well, I think, you know, having a strong voice is mm. really important. You know, I mean, I, I don't think we can kid ourselves about the fact that it's pretty hard to do if you don't know anybody. Yeah. Um, you know, looking at what jobs are available and applying for them and having good materials to show is um, is always good. It's better if you can get to somebody who knows somebody. I mean, the, you know, it's, that's the... I mean, I want to say that's overly simplistic, but, you know, if you look at who's getting hired at places like Vogue, <clears throat> there are very few people that don't have connections in one way or another or yeah. extremely necessary voices. And that's also something that, again, whether you're a designer or a writer or an editor, having a voice is incredibly important. And if you're, if you're interested in working at a glossy magazine, have a writerly way or the visual way, right? There's more, there's two kinds of editors at mm -hmm. those magazines. Uh, and um, writers better understand visuals because, you know, visuals are everything. I mean, I, I learned a long time ago, if I'm, if I'm working with a magazine, uh, most, you know, most of the magazines I work with are in print. They want, they don't want, they pay me to write in print, not for their digital versions because they digital pays less. And um, I have to, you know, either they're conceiving of the art up front sometimes often in advance of what the story is going to be the written story or if or if it's something that i'm pitching i have to know what the what the art is that's going to work for that publication before i come into it so there's no there's no 
just being a writer anymore, right? You have to understand the visual package. Being able to do podcasts, videos, things like that, and in the style that works for that publication, that that's you know, if it's Vogue, it's going to be very finished, right? There's nothing. Right. There's no unsophisticated <laughs> art in, associated with Vogue. Right. Uh, speaking of podcasts, I know you used to have a podcast, Hot Buttons. Um, what made you want to start that podcast? And do you <laughs> foresee yourself doing another podcast in the future? Um, I would I would love to do another podcast. I had so much fun doing Hot put, hot Buttons. Um, it just said, it, it, you know, part of it was there was a, the camaraderie. So I was, yeah. you know, I had, I had co-hosts. Um, I also had producers and sound engineers. I mean, that was a highly produced podcast. And so you, you always felt like there were people behind you <laughs> going to save you if you did something. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, again, that, again, like most of my career, it's not something I sought out. It was, they came to me um, and asked me to do it. They, um, you know, the idea was, was to kind of go into the fashion space with a group of people that were re really interested in, solving global global warming and 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 mm -hmm. getting people more interested in how we wipe you know the carbon out of the fashion industry and um i don't think we you know it, it turned out we just got hit at a, a time when funding for podcasts was was at a low and they wanted to do it at a certain level you know as i said there were sound engineers and right. whatnot behind it and it just i think it didn't it didn't develop sponsors which i think tells you a whole lot about where the fashion industry is when it comes to, um, you know, the uh, fashion industry expresses a lot of industry and it, a lot of interest in wanting to be carbon neutral and planet friendly. But when push comes to shove, that's not how they're marketing. They're not marketing that way. Right. So, <clears throat> Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Um, all right. Well, I really don't have much else. Um, so I guess we could just end with the podcast. Uh, like, what are you working on next? Um, I know you've written a book in the past. Are you working on another book? Is there any big research project you're working on? Um, so what's what's going on with you? I am, well, as I said, <laughs> short-term projects are, are freeze in the Oscars. Uh, yes, I have, um, am working on a book. It is not fashion related in any kind of a direct way, although there will be some fashion in it. And um, that's a long way off. That's a long, books aren't short-term projects. They, yeah. They, they take a while. Um, and, you know, in the, in the medium term over the next year, I am, I'm in the process of developing a new column for Vogue business, which is going to be an opinion column. Um, the first one was the, the one you read about New York fashion week needing a mom. So mm -hmm. there's more, more of that to come. And that's, um, that's fun for me to sort of think about where I'm going to take that call. Yeah. So it sounds like you're moving from, uh, you know, being the columnist with the Wall Street Journal, now you're moving to the Vogue business side. Is that a fair assumption? You know, I've been, I mean, I've, I've been, I left the Wall Street Journal, <laughs> however many years ago that was, I forget, six or seven years ago, um, with a completely different idea for what I was going to do. I want, I was going to, I switched agents, um, got a Dot, got an agent at William Morris and um, another one that was going to do public speaking engagements for me. I was going to write books and and do public speaking. It never occurred to me that magazines would come to me wanting me to write for them. And um, then they did. And I got so busy with a bunch of magazine stories that I put off all the other things. And um, one thing led to another. And here I have a career that I didn't anticipate. But Vogue Business is a it, it came along at a lovely time for me because it's a business publication that um, that allows me to sort of delve into topics that intrigue me and that I'm passionate about, but that wouldn't necessarily um, become a cover story for a magazine, right. right? And I found when I was only writing for magazines, I kept having all these story ideas that I wanted to pursue. And I, very unexpectedly, I have um, come to to have a very warm relationship and warm feelings for Vogue business. I think they have a sharp team. It's been fun to be a part. I mean, they were like a year old when I joined them. Um, and so when they came to me and asked me to, to do a column, uh, it was again, not something I had, I, I, <clears throat> I sound kind of rudderless. People keep coming to me 
with ideas to pursue and I like them and I do it. And that this is another one of these things. It's just very intriguing, uh, intriguing to me intellectually to be able to do it. I'm fortunate to be at a point in my career where, where I can sort of follow the fun leads. Yeah. And I'm a huge fan. You know, I've read everything that you put out, um, you know, the Willy Chavaria, the, the Ludovic uh, de Saint Sernin story, Obviously, um, you know, the New York Fashion Week needs a mom article. Um, so uh, I'm a huge fan of everything you've been putting out. Well, that's um, kind of you. But uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, I really do appreciate you coming on the podcast. Um, everyone go follow Christina on her social media. I'll put everything down in the description. Go read of all, all of her articles because they're always super interesting stories. Um, it was nice to meet you. And uh, thank you for being here. I enjoyed it. It was a pleasure to meet you too, Antonio. Yeah, thank you. Take care. All right, bye. Thank you everyone for joining. Please like the video, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you next time.